So I wanted to talk today about um, my experience in maintaining, supporting, sustaining scientific software, or my experience in maintaining and supporting scientific software, and about kind of the general, I, sort of a theme in this is the, the general idea of how scientific software gets sustained. Um, you know, I'm I'm a applied statistician working at a university. I think I'm evaluated primarily on um, grants and publications, and and but I guess what my, my focus is largely on collaborative research in helping scientists to make sense of their data, and I, I view as sort of secondary. Um, developing new methods to make sense of data. And then sort of third on the list is software that implements methods to help people make sense of data. Software is down on the list in terms of, um, but I end up spending a third or more of my, my time on, on software. It's been something that's that I've, I've enjoyed, that's been valuable to me. It's somewhat unusual, I think, um, in academics, the amount of time I've put into it. And I've primarily been focusing on this one package for R called RQTL. And I, I've been working on it for 20 years. You know, the, the idea for this package came at um, early in 2000. Really a, about the time that version one of R came out, at, at the time I really had no idea what I was getting into. And I think if I did know, I might not have embarked on this. Um, ultimately, it's be grown to be um, close to 40,000 lines of R code and nearly 25,000 lines of C code. So each dot here is one release of the package. and um, that the R documentation is sort of constructed by hand, typing it in rather than using that Roxygen 2 uh, approach that I had mentioned in class. And that R documentation is more than 15,000 lines. And, and you notice here that sort of the, the initial two years, for the most part, it was the, the stuff was just being analyzed in place, basically. Um, and I didn't start versioning to it and getting it on, um, releasing it until the end of 2001. But it wasn't until ver into version control until the beginning of 2008, and not and then we moved it to Git, put it on GitHub in 2009. You know, so like half of the life of the code, it we use no formal version control. I had um, worked with one programmer, a software engineer, with one of my collaborators. He he wrote a good amount of the code in, in the first you know four or five years, um, but much of this work has has been on my own. I would say, in addition, some of these big jumps in in code introduction were in collaboration, where I was incorporating other people's code into the software. Um, sort of evolved over time quite a lot. At this point, you can see that um, I'm not releasing new versions very often, and um, it's not increasing in size. It's basically in sort of a point of stasis where I'm just trying to keep it working. So you, you could ask why, you know, why spend so much time on this, this one package? Why put so much effort into it? A, a big part of the question is, big part of it is really that it, I use it in my own research that, you know, as you've seen throughout this class, I, you know, focus on QTL mapping both um, methods and in my collaborations. I need software for that. And, um, and, and so maintaining this package that I'm using sort of almost daily it is of selfish importance. The, the initial idea for the package was really that we wanted um, 
kind of an open platform to to build new methods um, to to be able to um, distribute our new methodological ideas to people that could be directly useful. Um, I think sort of the the other reasons for you know putting effort into this software has have all been kind of the indirect benefits that um, I've I've made a lot of collaborations from the work. The people use the software, find that um, that the problems that they're running into are a little bit beyond what they can really do on their own, and they seek me out for help. Um, some of those turn into longer term collaborations and lead to um, you know interesting scientific developments and or just you know new friendships. Um, and then I think you know partly it's that in in answering people's questions, you um, I mean, the, the reason to put effort into answering people's questions is partly um, so that they can use the software. If if you don't put effort into that part of it, um, people will get frustrated right away and they'll drop it. And in the same way, and you to try to make um, make it easier to answer people's questions is part of why you put effort into making the software easier to use. And then that turns out to be sort of a benefit to me. It turns out that some of the things that were hard for other people were slowing me down. And if I put a little of effort into the user interface, that it's better for me too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so the, I think those are the, so, I mean, there, the, I, you know, I wrote a paper about the software that's gotten a lot of, um, citations. It's my most cited paper, and that is um, got benefit when people are looking at evaluating me. They see this one paper that's got a lot of citations, um, but mostly the the benefits have been indirect and long term. Um, you know, a lot of effort for things that are not obvious. You know, the obvious to come from the work on the software. Nevertheless, I think that. Um, putting effort into this sort of thing can be really useful both in, you know, growing a network of friends in the scientific community and um, just, you know, build the tools that are going to be useful for your, for your life and then see how you can build them out to be useful to others as well. The, so it's a long project you've been working, I've been working on it for 20 years. Um, trying to identify good things about the project at this point are hard. And I, I don't, it's just, you've worked on a project for that long. Um, you start to forget what is good about it anymore. Um, but there are, <laughs> there are some good things to it. I think some of the code is actually quite nicely written. Um, in particular, kind of the, Sort of the the main core piece that is handling genotype data and the missing missing values uses uses this hid, hidden Markov model technology and that I think I did well and the the code is um, something I can be proud of. I think the basics of the user interface, the way that um, a user works with the software, has had some neat um, had some some clever engineering ideas that I think work have worked well. The, 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 um, the software has a lot of data diagnostics and data visualizations. I mean, that's, you know, big values of, of working with a package, having a package in R, but also, you know, good for this sort of um, data analysis software. I'm proud of that. And overall, the software is really pretty comprehensive and quite flexible. Um, you know, more than many of, you know, there, I mean, there are lots of other programs to do this sort of work. Um, my package covers somewhat more things and is kind of the easier to build upon in a way. 
But, you know, mostly after 20 years, you focus on, I mean, what, what comes to mind when you think about a project is are the, the bad things related to that. Um, and that, um, to, to describe to you sort of the, one of the worst of them, um, I'll explain a little bit about the imp the main input file for this, for this, um, package. So for QTL analysis, the data consists of, um, a set of phenotypes, a set of, and genotypes at a set of markers and the map that says where those markers sit in the genome. And um, so the, the main input is a common delimited file, you know, it's like a spreadsheet, where the, the, the initial columns are all the phenotypes, and then the subsequent columns are, each column is a marker, and the rows are all um, individuals. And it, except the second row and the third row are sort of chromosome identifications, the chromosome IDs for the markers and positions of the markers. So the first thing reading this data in is to, is to figure out where to split the phenotypes from the genotypes. And I do that by, you know, I require that these first, uh, the second and third rows, these initial um, fields are completely blank. No spaces, nothing, just completely blank. So then I can, I find where's the last blank in the second row, and that's where I split the phenotypes from the genotypes, and then I split off the map from the genotype data after that. Um, well, so, I mean, and initially this package was really for cases where you have, you know, a few hundred individuals and a few hundred markers, and, you know, like this case, you know, four phenotypes or, you know, a small number of phenotypes. People started to use it for eQTL analysis where they had 20,000 phenotypes and they would complain to me that, or I started to get email complaints that the, it would, the, their data would take a really long time to load. And I would ask, well, how much data do you have? And they'd say, I have 30,000 phenotypes. And I'd be like, well, you know, it's big. It's gonna take a while to load. Um, but I, it was, at one point, I had a data set that was maybe 1,500 phenotypes and 200 mice, and it took a minute to load the CSV file, which, you know, it's not a very big file. Something's really wrong. Um, so then I investigated, finally. It became a problem for me, so then I asked, what's going on? And I investigated, I found what I'll declare to be the stupidest R code ever. So this is um, really straight from the package at some point. And it, the code that really decides where the first, where to split the phenotype data from the genotype data. I guess the phenotype data from the genotype data. So I figure out how many columns are in the data set. And then I'm gonna do a loop from one to the number of columns. And I'm gonna ask um, for I equals one is the first, in, in the second row, are the first I columns all blank? If that's true, I mean, it, if that's not true, then break. If it is true, then repeat. So I ask, you know, is the first cell blank? Are the first two cells blank? Are the first three cells blank? Are the first four cells blank? Are the first five cells blank? And when I get to the first non-blank character, then I break out of this loop. Um, Hmm. So for, you know, I had, so I had a file that had a thousand, 1500 phenotypes or something like that. And it took a minute to load and it turned out that 58 seconds were spent um, on this loop, trying to find the first blank, first non-blank character in the second row. Um, So <laughs> I don't I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote this bit of code. I mean it works. It just works really inefficiently when you start to have a lot of columns. Um, and it was it was in the package for quite a long a long a long time before um, you know you can replace all this code with basically one line or two lines of code 
and, and that's what's in there now. But um, I've, I've said this before, and one of my favorite things to say, you know, open source means everyone can see my stupid mistakes, and version control means everyone can see every stupid mistake I've ever made. So you can, you know, I blogged about it, but you can go and look in the, the GitHub repository at um, for this package and, and find that bit of code that I don't, I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that down, but um, it was, you know, not um, my best work. Um, so that, I mean, that bad code is gone now. I mean, you know, it's been corrected. It was identified that there was an efficiency problem that we then fixed. Um, but there's plenty of other bad code in the software. Um, and it, much of it is because um, you come to new ideas of things to do or you try to fix problems as they're occurring. And rather than you know really sit down and redo things completely from scratch, you end up um, just adding additional conditions or make you know making the code more complicated. So in particular, this function scan two, this is, a function to do kind of a two two dimensional two QTL scan to just to look for interactions between QTL. That one function is almost 1,500 lines long. If you think, you know, you can look at like 80 lines on a page. You, I mean, on a screen. Just think how many screenfuls that one function is. And the, you know, the C code that's related to this task of doing two-dimensional scans is like 20% of the C code in the package. And it, you know, part of it is that, you know, it's a complicated problem, but part of it is that I've just, um, it's, that it, the, it was not designed, um, not designed well from the beginning. And it was um, gradually, revised rather than and and at no point did we really take a take the time to to clean it up and start over um, and the I, I guess another another glaring problem with the package is that, is that the, the the central data structures are quite complicated um, I you know, they are, you know, I have one data set, the one data structure that contains the genotype data, the phenotype data, and um, the genetic map. And it, it, the way that the software works is that I do these intermediate calculations um, with, say, the hidden Markov model, and that stuff gets added in to the data set. And some of that stuff just gets deeper and deeper into a really nested, um, complicated thing. So, I mean, this bit of code is a perfectly valid thing that you might want to do with RQTL, and there's no function to really pull out this piece in a useful way. I, at one point, learned about um, object attributes as a way to hide additional stuff, um, stick them into the object, but have the user not notice them. And I, I kind of went, I made, <laughs> I made great use of that, or bad use of that in any way. Um, so, I mean, a long-term project, there's good and bad stuff. Told you, I mean, there are some good things, but and there are some bad things. Um, part of that is by, part of that are, you know, just trade-off choices I've made, and part of that are, um, just not putting as much time into a project as it, it maybe deserves, um, especially in kind of rewriting. I want to tell you about a, a variety of other things that I've learned over the course of this, you know, software project. Some of these I've, I've mentioned before in the class, but I want to kind of re reiterate them again. So one, one is about, I mean, first about documentation. I mean, I've, you know, I said in that initial slide that um, our RQTL has like 15,000 lines of documentation code, those sort of detailed man pages that describe 
um, the inputs and outputs for every function in the package um, and include some examples. That sort of documentation um, is important as a reference, but is very seldom actually can referred to. Most of that documentation, no one ever actually reads. Users might look at examples that you put in there, but um, that detailed documentation um, is a heck of a lot of work and not as much of a benefit to people. What, what I find that users really want are um, tutorials of showing how to use the package sort of in practice, um, case study sort of things. Um, this is how if you want to do X with this package, here's an example of how you would do it. Here are the things that, here is the kind of code that you would write. Here are the results that you would look at and what you should be thinking about. Um, that's what people want to see. So if if you're, uh, when you put a package, when it, you know, if you're distributing a package to others, and if you want to see how should I spend my time, um, writing tutorials that show the package in action in the kinds of cases that users are, would be, the kinds of complex ways that users might be using it, that's really where to focus your time. The more that you can um, split that those tutorials up into kind of very directed, focused tutorials, I think the better. Rather than a long user guide that shows everything that a package could do, if you really focus on um, different kinds of ways that people might use a package and so that they can kind of select, oh, you know, which of these things do I really want to read? I think ideally for users is, is um, a tutorial that is exactly like what they want and they just can, you know, replace their data at the top with what you had been using and use basically the same code is exactly is what people really are hoping that you might provide for them. That, What, that, was obvious, that wasn't obvious to me at the beginning. It's something I really kind of learned over time. I mean, it's maybe should be clear from my own use of other people's software that that is the kind of thing that I, you know, that I'm looking for. Um, but it it was a it, it was a slow realization that that's where I should be focused on. User support. So. Um, you know, RQTL has basically one, a staff of one, both the developer and the, the user support group in a way. I focused mostly on having a, a Google, Google group, sort of an email list that people can join um, and get that, try to get them to ask questions there. Initially, I'd been hoping that people would ask questions and other users of our QTL would answer them, that I would create some sort of community of people asking each other questions. Um, that didn't really happen. It's mostly been people ask questions there or they send emails directly. Um, and I, basically, I'm the only one answering. Occasionally, you know, like one in 50 questions, someone else might answer, but it's mostly just me. Part of that is that the, for the, in order to prevent spam on the Google list, I've had to um, moderate most post postings. So the first time someone posts to the list, they um, I need to read it and make sure that it's not spam before anyone else can read it. So it tends to be then that I um, I read it before anybody else. I read the questions before anyone else does, and by the time I've read the question, I have the answer, and I'll like go ahead and answer before most other people have read it at all. So um, I haven't really built a community of people giving each other help, and that's partly because of um, the way in which I've just answered people's questions right away. I, I get, um, I don't know, probably a question today on average, although it tends to be, you know, some weeks I get 
10 questions and some weeks I don't get any questions. You can kind of see people's use of the software over time. It varies according to over the year. Um, I put a good amount of time into answering those questions. The questions vary in quality um, by which, I mean, quality of like my ability to answer the question because it was well explained. Um, but even some of my close collaborators will ask me questions like, I tried X and it didn't work. Um, and you cut, well, like, you know, what exactly did you do? Show me the code. And when you said it, when you say it didn't work, what exactly, how exactly did it not work? I mean, did it give you an error message? What was that error message? Or did it give you results that weren't um, as expected? Were the results, you know, a mess or were they just not good? Um, yeah, I need more detail. So many, lots of the times I'm asking people like, sh you know, what code did you use? What function are we talking about? And what was the exact error message you got? Um, and what were you trying to do? Tell me more about your data. The, <laughs> another common question is more like, can you look at the attached 25 page Word document and tell me if I'm doing something wrong? Um, you know, which is like the other direction where they, they have practically done their entire analysis for a paper um, and they want me to sort of verify that it's all okay, which um, is, is also something that it, it's hard for me to do. It's hard for me to explain why I don't um, really want to do that. So, I mean, the questions I get, so, oh, over time, I found it harder to maintain a positive attitude in responding to users. Um, and I, I think a, sort of a key technique I've learned is to um, put some space, some time between when I first read a person's question and when I respond. That rather than, you know, I read a question and respond right away, I will sit on it for a half an hour and then come back to it and respond after that. Um, and it's partly that I don't, um, you know, I've, I, I hear the same questions over and over again, you know, that should maybe point to a failure in the documentation, but um, part of it's just inherent in the the business that you'll get the same kinds of questions repeatedly. And I want to say, like, how many times have I explained this? I've explained this like a hundred times, but um, after, after you rest on it for a little bit, you realize that you've explained it a hundred times to a hundred different people. And um, it is that this person is totally new, hasn't seen all your answers and you can, um, you know, you need to start fresh. Question. Um, is it is it ever the case that a package written by a single person, a small group becomes more popular than expected demands of maintenance, user support, surpasses the capacity to keep up? What is done in response? Um, I, I think very often that's true. And if you look around um, GitHub, you'll find packages that have um, long lists of issues that no one is really addressing. Um, and I, it's maybe commonly the case that um, people are getting more questions about their package than they really are willing to devote to trying to answer. And what happens, I think mostly, mostly what happens is nothing, just like people don't get the help they want. Um, I've emailed you, I've emailed people about their packages and just gotten no response whatsoever. Um, I think it's common. I think the, it, it's not really what we want to happen, but, but it is, relatively common. 
Um, if you want people to use your software, uh, it, it's important to answer the the to answer the the basic initial question. The the most common one for me is, you know, it has to do with getting the data into the software in the right form. Um, and I, you know, do what I can to you know ask people to send me their data set and I'll take a look and see if I can get it in because, you know, the code to read in software is really hard to um, error check. Um, the, the kinds of errors that you see in people's in people's data are like broad and unpredictable. And um, I think, but, you know, I've been there. I, where I was, the, you know, that first few steps of working with a new software package can just be really hard. Um, any help you can provide people to get over that initial hump will lead you to people that are using your software, which is, you know, um, and then the questions after that become um, more enriching. I think, I, I mean, I, I see a lot of value in, in me, you know, in helping people and, um, and most of the time, these kinds of, you know, very simple early questions, or they seem simple to me, um, I am still the best person to answer them. And so I should go ahead and answer them and spend, devote time to that is a, a good thing. It just, it, I mean, I just have to admit that sometimes it's a struggle to maintain the positive attitude in responding to some people's questions, but um, it, it's better to do so than not. Question again. Yeah, Carl, I, I guess I was just wondering, um, in your experience at least, um, kind of what percentage of people who are contacting you are not necessarily having issues with your package, but are um, just kind of clearly not very good at R or kind of beginners, and that's the issue? And, and I guess I'm wondering how it's very often that for me, I mean, yeah. for this particular package, it's very often that this is, this is people's first use of R and, and they're, you know, I guess we're both trying to get them into it without actually learning that much R. Um, and that, I mean, that is a, a challenge. Um, and, and my hope has been that, you know, they get, they spend a bit of time in the package and see that it's valuable to them. And that leads them to then learn a bit more R and then the, um, it all starts to make sense. Um, but, ra you know, I think rather than say, go away and learn more R, you, um, it's, it's worthwhile to just um, try to help them through those initial stages. And, um, but yeah, that is, that is commonly the problem. I think that I'm happy to help people work through that. I'm less enthusiastic about um, a answering more science questions, like what is the right way to analyze these data or am I doing this right? Um, partly that <laughs> I usually don't have direct access to their data and it's, it's hard to, for me to say that they haven't missed something without really getting deep into it. So I would like, I mean, I, I would say, but more than half of the questions are not so much about software, but about QTL analysis. But those are the ones that I'm really more tentative about making strong statements um, about the way to, to do things. You, do you find it easy to kind of detect when someone is uh, more of an R novice? Um, or is it sometimes the case where someone comes with this very opaque kind of hard to parse question and then you later realize that they just don't really understand how to code. I, I would say I, I mostly sort of assume that they don't know much about R. Um, that's kind of my base assumption that I, I work with. And it, it's very, it's maybe specific to this particular kind, this particular package. Um, 
it, but yeah, I mean, I mostly just assume that that is contributing to it and need to help them to, um, and I mean, they're also kind of new to trying to get advice on how to use a package. And so that that's partly why they, um, you know, not really see, seeing things from my perspective, it's hard for people to know what they need to tell me about and what, um, you know, what part, what part of the, the input and output do I need to see and which part do I not need to see? And that's sort of the, you know, you see this variation between not telling me anything and then telling me absolutely everything. So another, another challenge that I've had with, with RQTL has been in, in incorporating other people's code. So um, there, a couple times that I, I put um, big effort into a collaboration with others to incorporate their code into RQTL. Um, and that, um, you know, partly I want to, you know, build out the package to, to handle everything, but incorporate, you know, what a challenge with incorporating other people's code is that then they disappear and I'm left both in trying to maintain the code and in providing support for it. Because people will then ask me about, you know, those aspects that someone else had really implemented. And I don't always know exactly um, w how to answer those questions. And um, to, I mean, that, that has been difficult. And, and it has also led to, you know, parts of the code that don't really all, um, that, that have made different design choices in a way, just like the, you know, the naming of arguments to functions that are, you know, not totally um, made compatible with each other. Um, I've, I've come to the conclusion that for a package like this, it's be it would it's best to have people, um, it you know, with big big things that they might want to insert to make those things separate packages that sit beside your package rather than to incorporate it all in. Um, so to help people to make sort of cognate packages that work together with your package makes it so that then well, um, then they're left responsible maintaining that code and they're left responsible to mo you know, for the most part to um, helping users with that part of the code. You know, there's, there's advantages to getting, getting their code directly into your package um, just so that it's more seamless to other users. And it, in, you know, if, if your package is the big seller, then it makes um, it is sort of an advertisement for these other related functions. Um, but in terms of long-term maintenance and support, it it's been um, it been hard a challenge um, for me to continue to maintain and support other people's code. I. So I mentioned before about version control. Um, you know, my initial version control of this package was just sort of at the end of every day, I would zip up the package as a, you know, a zip file, you know, went and changed the version numbers and I would just save all those zip files one by one. Um, it's kind of remarkable to me how I was able to keep doing that for, you know, eight years or whatever it was before moving to formal version control. Formal version, formal version control has, I mean, the big advantages for this sort of project are, you know, to be able to try out um, new features without breaking the working package um, and be able to, um, so that you can, you know, while, you know, if there's something that you want to add that you can have a branch in Git that's working on, that's working towards that while still you know, doing bug fixes on the main thing. And secondly, the collaboration with others that if someone else is working on implementing something within your package, um, they may change, you know, eight different files in doing what they're trying to do. Getting those eight, you know, the, the changes in those eight files into your, into your current version 
especially if some time went by, um, is really hard to do by hand um, and really easy to do with a version control system. Version, con I mean, version control for software projects is, you know, using Git is, you know, take some time to, to incorporate into your, you know, and, and is I think challenging at times for, for everyone, but for this sort of project, this sort of project, especially when collaboration is involved is like been super valuable. T <laughs> testing. Um, yeah, I w just want to emphasize again the value of having having tests. Um, you really want to, you know, that, I mean, a, a, our QTL has essentially n no tests or hardly any tests at all. There are no unit tests. Um, there are a few tests of just input and output. Um, really, the only testing that's done is is their examples in each of the help files, and we get error messages when those show up as I mean, and I mean, not working. Th that I think. I, it's remarkable how any of this software works. You, know, you got 40,000 lines of R code and 25,000 lines of C code and not a test in sight. Um, so not, um, not what I would do again, but you know, it does mostly work. Um, but I'm now thoroughly into unit tests, breaking down functions into much smaller pieces and have thorough tests that um, of of each piece. It um, would have we would have found a, a lot of bugs sooner, and um, it would it would make leave I would be more confident about changing things if I had tests that would ensure that I'm not breaking. Stuff. You know, 20 years of RQTL, you know, the main thing that it provides is this, you know, genome scan to find these peaks that show big differences in the trait values for diff for the different genotypes. You've seen this picture a bunch of times. Um, but the, and the, the big challenge has been that those peaks are too broad and have too many genes in them. And so, you know, since the time that we're devoting that, since what, the, you know, starting on this project really moved to these people are very interested in these multi-parent populations where instead of doing a cross between two strains they take eight strains and mix them together for many generations and really break up the genome into smaller pieces um but our the sort of the central data structure at the core of rqtl um, doesn't allow this i mean it pretty much assumes that you have two founders that you've crossed, and so um, in trying in trying to have software that would help people to analyze this kind of data, we really needed to start over again. Another real challenge has been, um, you know, the the growth and size of data sets. You know that initially I was working with. Um, you know, a couple hundred mice, maybe 500 mice, and um, one or two phenotypes, and no more than 100 or so genetic markers. And now the, you know, the, the scope, the number of, the size of the crosses have gotten bigger, where you're typically doing 500 or 1,000, and that was unusual 20 years ago. But also the, the number of genotypes we're working with, the, the markers across the genome is typically 20, you know, is at least 2,500, often um, 100,000 markers instead of 100 markers. And the phenotype data has grown enormously too. Instead of one or two phenotypes in a project, we're now typically having these, you know, EQTL analyses where we have 30,000 phenotypes or, um, 100 or 200 phenotypes could because we're looking at expression and gene expression in different tissues. Even more, I think, than the scale of the data is the scale of the results that we're producing is a challenge. That 
you know, if you think you think of big data as being really, you know, that the you know the number of markers, the number of phenotypes we're measuring is really grown. But the scale of the results that we're producing are are way bigger, you know, because even if we do something simple, like for every trait, do a scan across the genome to see which positions in the genome are showing, um, you know, are showing effect. Um, we the results matrix is, you know, for every genotype, for every phenotype, some measure of association. The re the size of the results that we produce is much bigger than the size of the, the data itself. Um, and that, I mean, that's a challenge just in storing it. In there's a challenge in figuring out um, also in, in helping my collaborators to find the interesting parts of it, just because the results they produced are hard to hold in your head all at one time. And another challenge I've had is just in organizing and automating these kinds of analyses that, you know, I have these large scale genotype and phenotype data that comes, but it really comes repeatedly in multiple batches. You know, I get, um, they measure a hundred mice and then they measure another hundred mice and then another hundred mice and then another hundred mice. And, and each time they want, um, they 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 want me to run analyses to see what's you know you know the state of things what you know what have we learned so far and then the phenotype expanded as they you know they bring in another collaborator who can measure some additional um, potentially related traits or measurements on the on the animals and then another collaborator that brings in they bring in to measure another set of things. Um, and sort of each time some new stuff comes into the project, they want, you know, results right away. And, you know, organizing, automating that analysis has, you know, it's so that it, um, I can get the results to my collaborators in a way that they can browse without sort of killing myself doing it has been a big challenge. And um, to to better handle the the high dimensional data, to better handle these modern crosses that have more parents, you know, the data structures that fit into RQTL, the the my initial package, I embarked on um, RQTL two, so I like to say now in three D. Um, basically started over um, you know so the the goal was to try to better handle the really high dimensional genotype and phenotype data and to better i mean to be able to handle these multi-parent populations and another part of it is that sort of the main analysis focus is not so much on um, the missing genotype information which we had in which was so important 20 years ago but rather to, to um, better handle the population structure in the um, these multi-parent populations they're working with. So to be able to fit these linear mixed models to handle a population structure. You, so it, you know, it, you could conceive of kind of redoing some of the internals of RQTL1. Um, but really just needed to start over. Um, you know, it's not like starting over um, from scratch, but but pretty, you know, you know, in that we can we can learn from I can learn from what I've done in the first package. So RQTL2, um, let's not make the same mistakes. Um, so in 20 years working on a package, you really feel like the, well, I've, I've probably been working on RQTL2 for five years at this point. So, you know, 15 years working on one package where you feel like this is kind of a mess. Let's start over fresh, focused, you know, um, it is re refreshing. Um, 
initially and allows you to get past some of what, you know, the challenges in the code base that you had. So the initial RQTL1, I was using straight C and um, now moving moved to C++ in this package RCPP, which is the sort of the way to pass data between R and C and C++. Um, doing that simplifies the the code interaction between R and the and the compiled code, and in the really the memory management of being able to avoid making big copies of large data sets from R into C um, has been huge. Um, really, my life is a lot easier when I moved from C to C++ and when I started using this RCPP package. Because RQTL1, RQTL2, they're both, like the, the bulk of the, the computational work is in the compiled code in C or C++. And in R is basically used for moving data around and doing graphics. Um, that C++ has been made the coding a lot easier for me. You know, I'm Roxygen two for the documentation. Um, you know, I guess I pointed out that no one really reads those detailed documentation files, but um, especially because no one because they're seldom read, I think the value of having Roxygen 2 to to construct them um, is has been a huge boon. And I've really focused on writing smaller functions of when a function gets is starting to do more than one thing of trying to break it down um, and then writing unit tests for those functions so that I, we can be more confident that those functions are working and we can find bugs more quickly as they show up as you know errors happening in these unit tests. And one feature I really like in this in the new design of the package is that this is really a single switch for the different cross types. So RQTL1, um, you know, there are a variety of different kinds of crosses you can analyze with back cross, inner cross, so forth. Um, and there's sort of throughout the code an if then kind of if else set of um, conditions happening. If it's a back cross, do this. If it's an inner cross, do that, and so forth. And that's sort of all over the place. And so if you want to implement analysis of a new kind of cross, you have to go and make changes all over the place in the code. In RQTL2, we basically have like objects know um, we, there's a there's a single switch for the cross type that occurs in one place in the code and nowhere else, um, and um, that makes it much easier to expand to deal with um, more crosses. So let let's not make the same mistakes was was one of my goals, but there are certain aspects of you know what you would call weaknesses of RQTL1 that turn out to be um, just personal weaknesses that I can't get over. One of them is that um, introducing yet another data input format um, to be able to handle more complicated crosses, I need different ways for people to read in data and I force them to do it, you know, so I need to introduce yet another complicated input format. Um, and then, I, you know, one of the complex, one of the problems with RQTL1 was these really complicated data structures. I think I've improved that somewhat, like the, the data structures are less complicated, but they're still pretty complicated. Um, I get, you know, when I, I guess one thing that I notice is that, you know, there's a trade-off between complicated, you know, having the data structures be simple and having the user interface be simple. That um, allowing the data structures to be more complicated makes it that the user interface, they just need to pass one thing in. They don't need to pass a series of things. Um, and I've focused on having the user interface be simpler, having the, you know, what functions people are, the code be somewhat simpler. And as a result, the data tends to be complicated, organized in a complicated way. Um, 
long term, my hope was to have a more precise specification of what those data structures are and to have kind of a developer's guide for the software that would go along with the user guide. But it's hard to put effort into it. And, you know, RQTL2, like RQTL1, is basically all me and nobody else working on it. Um, and sort of the, an overall sort of theme I was thinking about here was about how academic software gets sustained. Um, and how is it that I've able to um, keep this RQTL package going for 20 years? I think that the main <laughs> the main reason that it's been sustained is that I've continued to work in the research area. It continues to be part of um, my day-to-day -day analysis work, my methods work, my collaborative work. Um, I'm continuing to use the same software. You know, more typically, um, people develop software for a particular method, and then they but then they move on to a totally different research topic. You know, they start out they're interested in um, you know gene expression arrays, but then they switch and start working on something else. And so their software on gene expression array analysis um, is you know not something that they keep using, and so, so they're then not eager to keep keep it working or to expand it. You know, one way to try to get this sort of academic software to one way to try to sustain it is to form a community of people that are all really jointly interested in it and working on it. Um, it's hard to do, I think. That the other way to sustain it is for just one person or a couple people to continue to use it and maintain it. Um, and that then will be sustained as long as the, as they're involved. I don't think I have any like. I mean, I, I think the re the reason that that this software has worked for so long is just that it continues to be of selfish importance to me, and that's how it's it's gone. Um, I don't think that's a general solution to sustaining academic software, but it, it really seems to be a, a key explainer between software that continues to, to exist and work and software that um, gets orphaned, that no one is taking care of it anymore. The, um, just to acknowledge all the people that have contributed to RQTL over the years and that are, you know, helped me to devise RQTL 2 um, and then NIGMS, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, has um, funded my research work in this area for a long time. <laughs>